Live from Houston, Texas, it's The Cube. Covering Grace Hopper's celebration of women in computing. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Grace Hopper Conference here in Houston, Texas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. Our guest today is Julie Eberfeld, the Senior Vice President of, and Chief Information Officer of the Commercial Bank at Capital One. Welcome, so, thank you so much for joining us, Julie. Thank you, Rebecca, glad to be here. So I want to start the conversation by asking about a new product launch that you, that you announced, um, Capital One, teaching Alexa a new skill. Absolutely. Tell us more. Yeah, it was awesome. We had four of our women on stage announcing a brand new product that we offer on Alexa, so a new skill. We introduced Alexa skills earlier in the year where you could find out information about your credit card. And what we announced here at the conference was that you can ask Alexa, how much did I spend? So a little scary for some of us to yes. be able to say, like, how much did I spend? Especially but we're as we really enter excited. the holiday season yeah. where that, the answer might be, yes, a little scary. <laughs> but we're really excited because we think it's just the way people want to bank today. They, they want convenience. They want to be in their kitchen and be able to just ask Alexa, you know, something that they've thought about, you know, and ask how much did I spend at Starbucks last month or how much did I spend at the grocery Oh, last and she'll month, tabulate so. on monthly and weekly. Oh, this is. Yeah, it's, this is. it's for over 2,000 different merchants that we've, uh, you can get your information on and you, know, you can ask for a specific date or you can ask for a date range. So we're really excited about how it introduces the way we're thinking about banking and trying to bring humanity to banking and just reacting to the way that you want to bank. So bringing humanity to banking, but a real techie would say it's bringing AI, artificial intelligence, to banking. Yes, absolutely. Where are we, do you think, as someone who's in this industry, on that continuum in the sense of, are we just at the very beginning of, of, this, of this transformation? Oh, absolutely, I think so. I mean, I think you know, people are want to bank differently than they ever have just because their experience with technology is so different. But this whole data revolution and the whole way to think about machine learning and artificial intelligence, I mean, I think we're absolutely just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the opportunity that it creates. I mean, you've heard a lot at the conference about that topic and just, you know, the, the, the ideas that people have about where that can take us is amazing. And it's no different in banking. We have all kinds of ideas on the way that we're going to be able to simplify people's lives and give them the information they need through all of these technologies. So you are the chief information officer of the commercial bank at Capital yes. One, and you run a team that is designing and developing products for other companies. That's right. How, what is your, what do you, how is your approach to building that team? And, and what are you thinking about as you're hiring uh, technologists, men and women? How, how, how are you thinking about the strategy? You know, I mean, talent in the technology industry is one of our bigger challenges, right? I mean, you, you see all the data that predicts the number of open jobs that are going to be out there in the next five years and all the gaps that there will be in terms of people to be able to fill them. And so for us, thinking about the engineering talent that we need to be able to build the products that our customers demand is so important to us. And we know that that great talent is really hard to come by. And so not only do we want to get the best talent, but we want them to come in and have a very inclusive environment. So we think about how do people do their best work? They do their best work when they're happy at work, when they're engaged. And so that whole notion of inclusion is so important. But we also really think that the diversity lens is important as well, that we want different perspectives. We know that we're only going to get the best ideas and the best innovations, which is really what we're aiming for in order to satisfy our customers' needs if we have that diversity of thought. And so we want the diversity, that's why we're here, that's why we're really excited about the work we're doing in diversity, but we also know it doesn't stop with the hiring. That that whole notion of being engaged, feeling included, feeling you can get your voice in the room, that you can make a difference, and that you can do your best work is really what we're really focused on just as much as the hiring side of it. Right, so it's so it's hiring, hiring the right people, and then as you said, keeping them happy and, and engaged. Absolutely. How do you do that? What, what are some of the things that you're doing at Capital One, these strategies that you're implementing to make sure that people are, as you said, bringing them their best selves to work? We have a number of different programs. I think what we've been, what I've been focusing on for the last couple years is particularly related to diversity inclusion in tech, and um, in particular, our Women in Technology Initiative, which is you know, what got us here initially to Grace Hopper. 
we started initiative two years ago and it really was a grassroots effort. Just a couple young women who had heard what was happening in the industry, were concerned about what was happening in terms of just the numbers and the drop off in terms of women actually entering the tech field. But then also what they had heard about from their friends and what they were hearing in the media about cultures that were just really not feeling inclusive for women. And then this whole notion that women drop out of the tech field at over double the rate of men at sort of this midpoint of their career. Just at the point they're about to be your future leaders of tomorrow, they start to drop out. And, what, and why in your opinion? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of theories, there's some research about this. I mean, it, it does happen right about the time you are thinking about having your, your children, which can put a real uh, damper on your career. But what are, some other, what are some of the other reasons in your mind and in your experience? I mean, I, you know, there is a lot of research out there and yeah. we kind of rely on that research in terms of our understanding. I mean, I raised three children in this industry. It's been a great experience for me. But I think the research shows that that's not really the reason. I mean, that is a small percentage of the reason that women do drop out. But I think the research shows that the other reasons have to do with this feeling of, you know, maybe this isn't the right field for me. I don't really feel included. I, you know, you hear terms like death by a thousand cuts. Like maybe they can't even identify themselves. What really caused them to start to feel like this wasn't the right field for them? But, that, but something just doesn't feel right. And then somebody comes it's along. It's that problem that has no name, the yeah. Betty Friedan. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, you've been working with my business for a long time. You know, you know all about the technology, but you know a lot about my business as well. Why don't you come join me? And they get that offer and it just feels appetizing and maybe they don't really know why. And so I think we really want to continue to make this just a really compelling opportunity for women. You know. I, you have just that, these skills that you have and these tools that you have in your hands as an engineer is just amazing, right? So and how do you do it? How do you keep them? What, what, is, what are you doing? Keep giving them great assignments, okay. giving them visibility. So it's the tech candy. That's right. Good problems to solve. That's right. Um, and making sure that their voices can be heard, talking to everybody about what it might feel like. So how does that we, work out in practice? You're at a meeting and as you said, you are wanting to make sure that, that women feel their voices can be heard. What, what sort of strategies do you, do you do as a manager? Do I personally do? Yeah. Invite people into the conversation, right? I mean, you, you get to know the people on your team, you get to know, you know where they might be feeling less than comfortable and invite them into the conversation. I think we just went through some training for all of our people managers that we rolled out on bias training. And what we did this for you know, thousands of people managers because we felt it was really important that we had a common language that everyone could start to talk about bias because we all have it, but we could do it in a really simple and common language sort of way. And so we introduced this training and now everyone, you hear everyone talking about it. Hey, I think that I'm experiencing some safety bias here. I think we're experiencing some distance bias. We're not letting the person who's on the phone or that works remotely have as much say as the ones who are local to us. And so it's really awesome to see how people are and using it can, that. It starts out a little tongue in cheek of, I'm just reciting what I learned yeah. in my training, but then it be, can become a real, a real thing. Absolutely, because it, you know, it, we make a lot of decisions every day. Some of them are quick and easy and some of them are really complex decisions and really meaningful decisions. And so we've also taken that bias training into our people management practices because we think that is the moments of truth. When you're doing performance management at the end of the year or you're doing talent assessments that we do throughout the year, those are the moments that bias can creep in, and so we know that, we know everybody has them, so we've tried to introduce, hey, these are the risks of bias that you run into during these different people management practices, and here are some mitigating approaches. I think that's the piece that's often missing from bias training, is like, how, well, okay, so we all have bias, and then we can all just kind of wash our hands of that and say, okay, this training actually says you, there are ways to mitigate that bias and we try to train people in these moments, here are the ways that you can make sure that you try to mitigate that bias. And so I think these different biases, like distance bias is a really common one. We have people who are on the phone and we don't invite so them in. So many remote and, workers today. Right, and so all these things build up to creating a more inclusive environment. When people understand the biases that they might have and how they then can mitigate it, that applies to all of us, right? We, everybody has something different they bring to the table. But some of them do particularly you know, affect women more acutely. 
And so we also introduced a program that we're really proud of, which is our Men as Allies program. Men and as Allies. Men as Allies. Okay. All right. And it really was a completely grassroots effort, which is what I really love. It wasn't, uh, you know, let's have a demand from the top that we start this program. It was something that came out of our Women in Tech initiative. And so one of our women attended a conference with a male partner and a, a, one of her peer executives. And they went to the conference where they spoke about just some of the experiences that mm -hmm. women have in the workplace and how men react to that in the workplace, how men feel in dealing with women's issues so in the workplace. So give me some examples, because I, I, I mean, I think I know what you're talking about, I think our viewers can, can relate, but just what were some of the experiences that they talked about? One of the things that um, Mike talks about is his realization that women don't necessarily get the same feedback as men. Mm. So early in your career, you might have something that you know needs to be corrected, and a man coaching another man, and this, by the way, is also women managers, but they will coach a man very directly. They will tell them exactly what they need to do. Here's this kind of career limiting behaviors that you need to correct, and if you correct this, you're going to be on a better trajectory for your career. Women, on the other hand, get very softened feedback. You know, I think we're socialized to. Mm -hmm not to think about women and have more, you know, we're just softer in our approach to right. women. And so they don't get the same feedback. And then lo and behold, five, six, seven years into their career, maybe this thing that could have been corrected in their first first year or second year hadn't been corrected and maybe is starting to create and becomes some challenges the Achilles heel for them. For them to get that next promotion, that next choice assignment. Absolutely. I think there were other things like, um, you know, this realization that you make assumptions about what people may or may not want to do in their career. And so I think some of our managers realize that, oh gosh, you know, I had an opportunity and men a move. Um, and I just didn't ask this particular woman if she might be interested because I thought that that just wouldn't fit into her family life. And so instead of making that assumption, you know, you really should ask. Right, and, because it wouldn't be the same assumption you'd make about a man of, oh, well, he's got three kids in school, he doesn't want to move. You would still ask the man, but you would think of differently. It's That's true. right. It's really and true. And so I think there were different And I elements. think, as a woman, I'm guilty of it too. And it's, it's not just, a, a, a male manager who would make that assumption. That's right, and I think that's one of the important things that we've tried to be really inclusive around the notion that you know many of these things are not just men to women, they are all managers, tend to have some of these biases and some of these assumptions and that we can think differently about it by being just more aware that that's what we do. I think also just learning that you know women do have a tendency to feel like they have to be 100% qualified for a job there's a lot of research on that. Exactly. That, that a woman sees a job ad and, and says, oh, I can't do the seven things they ask, I can only do five, I'm not qualified. Exactly. A and man can do two and he signs up. Exactly, and especially I think in engineering, I think it's even amplified. When you're a software engineer and it says you need to have these skills and you're like, well, I don't have some of those skills so I shouldn't apply, whereas you know, we all know that we can learn these skills, and so I think what we've tried to say is that for some of our women, if we think that a woman is really a great candidate for a job, don't wait for her to kind of put her name in the hat. Just go and reach out and tap her and say, hey, I think this would be a great job opportunity for you. And even if she says, well, you know, I'm not sure I'm qualified, you have to Give kind of go nudge. that next step. Give her the step. push, great. Yes. Julie Elberfeld, thank you so much for joining us. It's been terrific talking to you. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight, your host for theCUBE's coverage of the Grace Hopper Conference here in Houston, Texas. We'll be back after this break. Was